Okay. Um, yeah, it's a little bit late Saturday night, uh, but I've been thinking about something, and I'm going to rant a little bit again. Um, this will primarily go out to trainers, fitness professionals, um, people I know in the field who um, maybe, you know, I chat with uh, about exercise and ethics and, and a lot of stuff like that. So here's a soapbox moment. Um, everybody's got biases. We all do. We're human. It's human nature to have certain things you like and certain things you don't like. But another thing that we have as humans is the ability to separate ourselves from those emotions or separate ourselves from our biases for the greater good or for the purposes of doing something that we feel has more value. Um, that's to some extent, I think, what the definition of being a professional is. You're able to put aside your own personal desires, your own preferences and tastes, um, in order to be a little bit more objective about things and uh, apply good, sound, logical reasoning. Well, in terms of being a personal trainer and a strength and conditioning specialist, um, if you're working in any kind of field, really, uh, dealing with personal training, fitness, health, coaching, anything like that, you can't let your biases negatively well, influence at all, really, your decisions. At least not if you want to be the best professional you can be. If you're going to be professional and be truly competent in what you do, you've got to push that away and be objective. You've got to look at what's best for the client, look at what's best for the person that you're dealing with or for yourself if you're training yourself. So that statement there goes out to anybody else who's not a trainer. Um, we always have to be as objective as possible. Specifically, I see a big problem with this in terms of tools. And when I say tools, I mean both the methods that we use the, the, the approaches and the, you know, the t styles of exercising we like to try, whether it's a cardio thing or interval training or resistance training or whatever, as well as the very specific tools that we use within those. So just looking at resistance training, quote unquote resistance training, because all training has some resistance to it by definition. Um, but the things we think of as resistance training, like weight training and stuff, well, you know, you got people that are all over the spectrum that like like one thing or another and it shouldn't be what you like but you know whether it's free weights or body weight or machines or cables or uh, bands or tubing or um, medicine balls and sandbags whatever it is you can't condemn it you can't unjustly condemn it just because you don't like the way it looks or because you had a certain experience with it maybe until you you know step back and really look at what it is. Virtually every tool I've seen, with a few exceptions, introduced into the exercise world um, can have a certain use. They can have a purpose. It's just understanding the physics enough, understanding the tool well enough, and understanding the human body well enough to know where and when you would or would not want to apply that tool. Um, you know, people say that bands are only for rehab. Shut up. No, they're not. Or... Free weights are always, you know, the most functional, quote unquote, whatever that word means, or, or they're the most um, useful because they get the most done in the shortest amount of time. Maybe. It looks like they do, but you have to understand what your goal really is. You know, um, the grosser your tool or the more global your tool, for instance, if you're putting a bar across someone's back and just saying, move it up and down, um, you'll have a whole bunch of muscles involved in that, sure. But... You can't pinpoint where those loads are going necessarily. Um, it's much more dynamic. It's much more free-flowing. And you have to make a lot of assumptions when it comes down to, you know, what, what you think you're maybe training. You know, is it the glutes? Is it the hamstrings or, you know, or the quads? And if so, all of them together? Is it a specific division of the quad? Is it only one or two of the hamstring muscles? Are other ones maybe deficient? Uh, you know, which division of the glute? And that's just one example. Um, we have to make a lot of assumptions. You can have other tools that are more specific. You know, uh, if you understand forces and you understand the body well enough, you can take bands and use that tool in a very specific way so you can challenge exactly the muscle you're trying to challenge. I can talk more about this in the future in, in more detail if there's desire for it. And I'm definitely going to blog about it. Um, but for now, just the general idea is important, I think, to understand that every tool has a place. Every tool has a purpose, maybe many purposes, and we cannot 
unjustly praise one or unjustly condemn another just because we do or don't like something. So when people come to me and say, do you like this or do you like that? You know, uh, uh, you know there are hot topics like, you know, yoga or CrossFit or, you know, traditional long steady state endurance aerobics training or something like that or weightlifting. I say it's irrelevant. What I like is irrelevant. If I'm training a person, I use whatever is the most appropriate thing for them. And the only way I can decide what the most appropriate tool is, is for me to understand well enough the forces that I'm applying to that person's body with whatever tools I have access to. You best believe that I'm not going to have a person, um, you know, swinging kettlebells around or throwing sandbags around if I don't first understand how that object is put together and then how that exercise, whatever I construct as an exercise, is going to affect that person's body in terms of force angles and moment arms and, you know, resistance profiles in general, you know, where it's going to be hard and where it's going to be easier and, you know, throughout the movement, um, how those muscles are going to change in terms of their angle of pull, active and passive insufficiency questions are going to, going to arise, um, you know, and I have to understand torque and inertia and all these other things that may not be sexy words, but we have to know them. As exercise professionals, if you're going to call yourself an expert, and I would put that in bold and italicize it and put a little asterisk next to it too, because that's a loaded word. Um, but if we're going to call ourselves experts, we got to earn that. So, you know, I always get a little bit dismayed whenever I see somebody or hear somebody talking about a specific exercise or a specific tool or method and just saying, no, that doesn't work. Be cautious. Anytime you hear a person saying that something is always good or always bad, a red flag should go, should go up. You know, a little light bulb should go off in your brain and you should say, hmm, that person maybe doesn't know exactly what they're talking about. Maybe they're not well informed. It's kind of like po politics to some extent. You get a lot of people that are extremely on one end or extremely on the other end of, a, of an issue. And oftentimes what do we find with experience and maturity? Not all the time, but often. Uh, the truth or what we find to be the most sensible solution is often kind of somewhere in the middle. There's a moderate nature to people that have a lot of experience and knowledge in a field. You know, As I go through grad school, the further I get into my program, the more studying and education I get, uh, the more I realize that I still have a lot to learn. And generally speaking, hopefully it comes off, I don't know, uh, the more humble I've become in terms of my own assumptions about what I understand. So as trainers, we all have to have that thought process guiding everything we do. We've all got to be able to say, okay, I maybe like this exercise more than that, and that's fine. For me, maybe I'll do that because I like it. But what does this person need? How do the forces actually work with this object? What's going to get the job done? First off, what is my job? And then what's going to get that job done? So uh, it was just a little rant about that, and I might go more specific about it in terms of describing forces and comparing different exercises, um, or at least sharing some links um, to blogs and websites that explain it better than I could um, to anybody that might be interested. So it's something that kind of just peeves me a little bit, gets on my nerves. Uh, when people are really quick to condemn something or to praise something before they really understand what it is. You can't say that something's good or bad if you don't really understand it. Just like you can't say a person's a good person or a bad person until you really know about their life and their motivations and what they do outside of the five minutes a day that you maybe see them. Same thing with a tool, same thing with an exercise. So we've all got to understand that and keep ourselves objective as much as we can as humans. And as exercise professionals, I think it's our job partly to keep each other in check, to keep a dialogue open. And to make sure that we all are able to sit around the table and be civil and, and voice our concerns when we think something might be a little bit amiss. Or if we have a good idea about something and share it. And then look at it objectively as a group and say, okay, well, what does the science say? What do the facts say? What does the situation tell us? So uh, I don't know if anybody watching got anything out of that. But I wanted to share this. It was on my mind. Um, definitely, I think, fodder for deeper discussions in the future, but the video is starting to run long, so I'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. More to come.